also the placenta uh, you know, is selectively permeable and so some substances can be blocked from moving across from the mother to the fetus and then others can be able to cross. I'm sure we remember the placental barrier, the placental barrier or membrane, uh, the components of the placenta uh, barrier. Okay, anyone who wants to remind us uh, the components? Anyone? Oh, yes, sir. Cytotrophoblast, good. Uh -huh. Which other? Yes, others to add. Which other components? Yes, sir. Come again. Extra embryonic meso. Extra embryonic meso. Okay, yeah. Our grid, so there is mesodermal tissue. Yes, mesodermal tissue, extra embryonic, of course, because it's not uh, the mesoderm for the embryo proper. Okay, good. Any other um, structure? One more missing? Yes, sir. The end, the, the what? Ah, no. <laughs> Not the endometrium. Yes, sir. Come again. Connective what? Skin. Yeah, I can make the last one. Huh? All connective streak. Ah, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. No wonder I was failing to get the last one. <laughs> yes, sir. Sinusoids. Yeah, you're almost there. Yeah, yeah. You are closer. Closer to home. The endometrium. I mean, the. What did I say? You see now. The endothelium. Endothelium. Okay. Endothelium. Okay. So endothelium, remember the endothelium is a, an epithelium of a blood vessel. So in this case, we have capillaries uh, within the chorionic villi. We have capillaries and they have endothelium. So the endothelium of the capillaries, and then if you are starting from inside going outside, so the endothelium of the capillaries, then we have mesodermal tissue, then we have cytotrophoblast and syncytial trophoblast. Those are the components of the placental barrier. And so this barrier is able to select what substances should cross and which ones should not. Okay, and I think uh, I had mentioned uh, some time back that we have certain infections, for instance, uh, the torch infections. Which ones should cross, which ones should not and IgG is able to cross because of its molecular size. It is smaller compared to the others, okay? All right, so those are just some highlights of the functions of the placenta. Now, the placenta, we need to know that uh, it is not found in all animals, all types of animals, okay? It is only certain animals uh, where we find the placenta, such as human beings. What do we call such animals which have a placenta? You guys are from doing biology. Animal biology. <laughs> what do we call such animals which have a placenta? Oh, yes. Eutherian mammals. Okay, the eutherian mammals. Okay. I've never heard of that. <laughs> What type of biology did you do? Huh? Or oh, you missed that lecture? <laughs> so eutherian mammals, okay? So only eutherian mammals uh, have a placenta. Others, they don't. Okay, so human beings are part of those animals. Um, yeah. Okay, then um, we need to know three main features three main features that describe 
the human placenta. Three main features that describe the human placenta. So number one is the shape. The shape of the human placenta. The human placenta is like a disc. Okay, it's like a disc. So it's disc shaped. And so uh, we describe it as being discoid. Okay, discoid. Uh, because it assumes the shape of a disc. So that's why we call it uh, discoid. So that's number one. Number two. Number two, the human placenta is described as being decidued. Decidued from the word decidious. So for instance, if you want to describe certain trees, you can say decidious trees. Isn't it? You have heard of deciduous trees? Yes, so those which shed uh, their leaves okay, during uh, winter, okay, they shed leaves. And then during summer, uh, the leaves come back okay, um, after the rains. So deciduous, or even deciduous teeth. I'm sure we have heard of deciduous teeth, which are the primary teeth or milk teeth that uh, appear uh, when a child is six months old, okay, around six months, and then uh, they shed off around six years, okay, they start coming out. So those are uh, temporal teeth or deciduous teeth, okay. So even the placenta is described as being deciduous, okay, the human placenta. Why do we describe it like that? Is because the placenta, when it gets shed, shed uh, after birth, during delivery, uh, part of the, you know, uh, part of the maternal tissue uh, of the endometrium, okay, the decidia in this case, the decidia, uh, so you must know the decidia is basically the functional layer of the endometrium during pregnancy the functional layer of the endometrium during pregnancy okay the functional layer of the endometrium during pregnancy so that layer part of it uh, you know sheds off with the placenta during delivery and so we describe that as being decidued okay you learn uh, that the placenta has two portions of the fetal portion and the maternal portion. The maternal portion, part of it, as it sheds off, it gets the endometrial tissue uh, from the mother's tissue, so it comes out together. Okay, that's why we describe it as being decidued. That's number two. Number three, very important, is that the human placenta is described as being homochorio. Homochorio, okay? Homochorio or hemochorio, okay? So why? It's because of the fact that uh, the coronic villi, the coronic villi, if you can, uh, you know, imagine the coronic villi, the finger-like projections, okay? Those villi, they dip into maternal blood. They dip into maternal blood. Okay, and so they are surrounded by maternal blood. They are surrounded by maternal blood. Okay, so the maternal blood surrounds the coronic vera. And so uh, the mother's blood does not mix with the fetal blood. The mother's blood does not mix with the fetal blood. The fetal blood just circulates in the coronic villi, and the maternal blood circulates in these intervillous uh, spaces, intervillous lakes, okay? So uh, the coronic villi, because they are surrounded by maternal blood, they are described as hemochorio, hemochorio, okay? So the human placenta is hemochorio, no mixing of the fetal and maternal blood. That is a very
Okay, so unfortunately we are unable to project. So the PowerPoint presentation will be shared uh, to the rest of the class. And then we follow the uh, pictures. Yeah. So uh, that's that. So we need to know those three features, those three features of the placenta. It's discoid, deciduate, and hemochorion. Um, yes, sir. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, so, yeah, so what sheds is basically part of the decidia. Okay, the decidia, I started by describing the decidia. I said that the decidia is that functional layer of the endometrium during pregnancy. Okay, during pregnancy, the functional layer on top, remember the compact layer and the spongy layer of the endometrium, that is the functional layer. So now that layer during pregnancy is described as uh, decidia. Okay, that's the decidia. Now during the placenta formation, we have two portions. One portion is fetal, the other portion is maternal. Okay, and that's where we are actually going. Uh, maybe I can just highlight here that the fetal portion comes from what we call the chorion what? We didn't do this. I think we did this sometime. Mm. The fetal portion comes from the chorion frondosa. Okay, frondosa. Chorion frondosa. Whereas the maternal portion comes from the Decidia basalis. Decidia basalis. Okay, so you need to know these two. The fetal portion comes from chorion frondosa, whereas the maternal portion comes from the decidia basalis. Okay, now that decidia basalis forms the maternal portion, and so during uh, uh, delivery of the placenta after the baby comes out and the placenta now decays from the uterus, part of the decidia comes out together with the placenta. And that's why we, we call it decidiate, because it's shaped uh, during delivery. Yeah, so that's uh, that one. Then the other question. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, so that is the uh, description. So let's uh, know those three features. Discoid, uh, decidiate, and uh, hemochorion. Okay, any other question? Yes, sir. Why is it disc shaped? Uh, that's how it was made. <laughs> I don't know why it's disc shaped. It's a difficult question. Yeah. So we, we found it like that. <laughs> All right, okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Yes, madam. What happens if the placenta doesn't shadow? What happens if the placenta doesn't shadow? Doesn't shadow? That is pathological. That is abnormal, okay, and very dangerous to the mother. Because if the placenta doesn't come out uh, during delivery, the then it will mean that this placenta will continue being attached to the uterus. And we have three types. It's just that um, I can project, but the presentation will be shared. That's part of the presentation. That the placenta sometimes can be morbidly adherent to the uterus. And so uh, you can't, you know, it can't come out on its own. Okay? And if that happens, it's either there is what we call placenta accreta, accreta, or there is placenta ecreta, or there is placenta decreta. So three possibilities. Placenta accreta, placenta ecreta, and placenta decreta. 
Now, what do we mean by these uh, terms? In placenta creta, the placenta, all of them is abnormal, you know, implantation, abnormal implantation of the placenta, of course, but it is the degree of penetration into the myometrium that, you know, uh, classifies these three uh, pathological states. So the first one, the placenta accreta, it means that the placenta has gone beyond the normal limit of, uh, uh, you know, of penetration uh, by at least maybe to one third of uh, the, uh, the myometria. It has gone beyond one third of the thickness of the myometria, okay, which was not supposed to be the case. However, uh, during delivery, of course, it will be difficult to deliver that one, but sometimes you can manually, manually remove the placenta uh, in a crypta sometimes, but not all times, okay? So the depth of penetration is to at least beyond one third of the, uh, uh, the myometrial thickness. Then in Ikrita, it has gone beyond that one third, and now it's almost in the last one third of the myometrium. Okay? Hope you are imagining uh, the, the uterus wall. So we have endometrium, myometrium, perimetrium. Okay, after that, you are in the cavity, in the abdominal cavity. So in Akrita, it has gone beyond the normal penetration, slightly beyond the normal, the normal limit of penetration. Then in Ikrita, it has even gone beyond that uh, normal limit to about maybe one third of the last thickness of the uh, myometria, but still within the myometria. And then in Pekrita, in Pekrita now it has gone beyond the myometria to involve the perimetrium and even beyond the perimetrium outside the uterus. So you can imagine the placenta, you know, penetrating beyond the uterus wall, involving all the three layers and beyond. And so the placenta goes to attach to the visceral structures, such as the mesentery, such as the intestines, uh, and so many organs, the liver, and so on. So you can attach now to those structures outside the uterus. So those are the degrees of pen abnormal penetration of uh, the placenta. Now those three, they will risk the mother uh, of major hemorrhage, major hemorrhage. The mother can bleed to death if you don't intervene, okay? If you don't intervene, the placenta is still attached, okay? The mother will continue losing blood after delivery and can lose a lot of blood and the woman can exsanguinate. Yes, sir. <laughs> can you can what? Can the fetus survive? Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, somehow slightly away from the topic, but he has asked a uh, placenta abruption. Placenta abruption is uh, basically premature separation of the placenta from the uterus. Okay, and so uh, it can be concealed within the uterus or it can be reviewed. The breeding can be reviewed where the breeding is coming out through the vagina. Uh, the survival of the fetus depends with the degree of breeding. Okay, so if it's just a minor abruption, a minor abruption, the, the, the baby can survive. Okay. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the pregnancy can continue if it's minimal uh, blood loss. But if it's a major blood loss, definitely the baby, within a short period of time, can die if you don't intervene. And so in abruption, you have to be quick to deliver the baby. If the baby is still alive, uh, you have to do an emergency cesarean section. But if the fetus is dead, there is no need to deliver by Caesar, so you will deliver vagina. Yes, yes, madam. Come again.
Uh -huh, yeah, so I was coming to that. Yeah, so uh, cases of placenta are greater, in greater, and be greater, how we manage them. So the management is that in placenta accreta and ecreta, the phase two, the management is basically hysterectomy, okay? Meaning removal of the uterus. That is the best you can do for that woman. To avoid death because of major hemorrhage, remove the uterus together with the placenta, okay? That is how we manage placenta accreta and ecreta. Because if you don't intervene, the woman will bleed to death. So what is the good? To leave the woman like that, you know, bleeding to death, or to remove the uterus, even if it's the first baby. <laughs> and maybe that baby has even died. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the best is to remove the uterus. Okay, that's the goal of obstetrics. The goal of obstetrics is uh, the life of the mother comes first and not the fetus. Okay, so you remove the uterus. But if uh, there is placenta pecrita, this one which has gone beyond the uterus wall to involve the intestines, the mesentery, and so on, the river, okay, this one you don't uh, fidget. Okay, you don't fidget with it. Once you uh, have recognized that this is placenta pecrita, you just cut short the umbilical cord, okay, as much as possible, and leave the placenta in situ, meaning you leave it the way it is. Don't temper. Because if you temper, it's like now you are, you know, the lion was uh, sleeping, then now you. <laughs> You know, it will kill you, isn't it? Yeah. Or the bees are come, then you go and disturb them. They will bite you. So, with placenta pegrita, you just leave it like that. Okay? And uh, uh, afterwards, you give drugs to kill the uh, fetal, I mean the placental cells. Okay? So, you, uh, we use uh, a drug called methotrexate. So, methotrexate is able to kill them, it's able to select okay, the placental cells and kill them. So the placenta will degenerate and uh, with time it, the tissue will disappear. That's how we manage the pecrita. Because if you fidget, if you try to disturb, uh, you know, it has gone beyond the uterus and so as you pull like that, you are basically causing also the visceral structures to be damaged. The intestines will be damaged, the liver and so on, and the woman will bleed even more. So, and you won't even manage to stop the bleeding uh, once that is the case. The same applies to abdominal pregnancy. Okay, sometimes an ectopic pregnancy may not be in the tube, it will be in the abdominal cavity. Okay, and so again, it's the same thing. Just remove the fetus, cut short the cord, leave the placenta the way it is, and then give drugs after. If you temper, to remove the placenta in the abdomen, the woman will bleed to death because you are rupturing the uh, vessels. Yes, sir. I think we need to progress. Otherwise, the whole session will just be questions. Okay, a good question. So to avoid removal of the whole uterus, why can't uh, we give methotrexate uh, um, in the placenta accreta and the ecreta? So, the thing is, in placenta accreta and ecreta, okay, uh, the way we come to realize that this is the case is where you have attempted to remove this uh, placenta. Okay, you have attempted to remove the placenta by bullying, and then you just see that it can't come out. Okay, it can't come out. But the bleeding will continue. In this case, the best is to remove the entire uterus, okay, to prevent further bleeding. In placenta pecrita, even if we do that, we leave the placenta like that, the woman may actually continue bleeding after, uh, you know, afterwards. Even if you leave it like that, you are 
you have, you have, you have just uh, weighed the risk versus benefit. Which one uh, are you going for? Okay, in this case, where there is placenta pecrita, yes, the woman will, bleed, will continue bleeding, but maybe you can survive. But who knows, maybe she may not make it. But in placenta accreta and decreta, you are guaranteed that once you remove the uterus, there will be no further breeding and no further risk. Okay, so the risk is still there in the pecrita. Yeah. Okay, we need to proceed. Yeah, so that's the uh, placenta. The next uh, section, I think, um, let me just guide it. Yeah, so the next section is changes in the trophoblast, which I think we covered, okay, how the uh, villi, the differentiation of the primary colonic villi, the secondary colonic villi, tertiary colonic villi. Okay, well, I'm sure we are able to uh, know the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary villi, isn't it? Yeah, so this one we'll skip. Ah, yes. <laughs> When the room you have managed to share with the rest? Sorry? Oh, who is it? You have managed? Okay. Yeah, so the next is the chorionic, uh, I mean, the chorion frondosum and decidia basalis, and that's where uh, I was saying that, uh, you know, these two, they are the ones which form the placenta. So, chorion frondosum and decidia basalis. So I've already highlighted that the fetal portion of the placenta comes from chorion frondosa, whereas the maternal portion comes from the decidia basalis. And therefore, we need to describe these two. What is chorion frondosa and what is decidia basalis? So we'll start with the chorion. So the chorion frondosa, the chorion frondosum basically is the bushy portion of the chorion, the rough portion of the chorion having the chorionic villi, having the chorionic villi. As the chorion is developing, as the chorion is developing, the entire chorion, okay, chorion is a membrane, eventually it's a membrane, okay, so this chorion, as it is developing, in the initial stages, the entire chorion has villi. But with further, uh, I mean, development, with further development, at the embryonic pole, at the embryonic pole, the villi differentiate. Okay, they continue developing and they differentiate uh, to eventually uh, uh, mature to the tertiary stage. Okay, to the tertiary villi, okay? that is to the uh, embryonic pole. But on the ab embryonic pole, away from the embryo, the chorion there, what does it do? The, the villi rather, the villi, they disappear. They disappear, they degenerate, disappear, okay? and that part becomes smooth. So there is a smooth chorion and a rough chorion. The rough chorion is on the embryonic pole, whereas the smooth chorion is on the ab embryonic pole. Now the chorion on the embryonic pole is what we call chorion frondosum. Chorion frondosum, the one with villi. Then the one which is away from the, the smooth one, we call it chorion levi. Chorion levi. Okay? The chorion levi does not contribute to the development of the placenta. The chorion levy does not contribute to the development of the placenta. It is only the chorion frondosum that forms the fetal portion of the placenta. So that's the chorion. So you need to know how to describe the chorion. Okay, and uh, 
the chorion is part of the fetal membranes. There are two fetal membranes. We have the chorion and the other one is what? The amnion. Okay, amnion. So we have the chorion and amnion. So the chorion is what I'm just from describing. Then the amnion would describe it. Uh, it's around the fetus. Okay, it's around the fetus and it secretes amniotic fluid in the amniotic cavity. Okay, an important fluid, uh, protection, and so on. Yeah, so that's the chorion frondosa. Then we go to the, so the, the, there's a picture there uh, which is showing the chorion frondosum and chorion levi, you see it there. Then the decidia pesaris, decidia pesaris. So like I mentioned again, the decidia is the functional layer of the endometrium during pregnancy. During pregnancy, the functional layer of the endometrium is called decidia. Now, this decidia also has parts. Also has parts. So, we have three types of decidia. Three types of decidia. We have this very one, decidia basalis. That's number one, decidia basalis. The number two, we have decidia capsularis. Decidia capsularis, like a capsule, from the weight capsule. Decidia capsularis. And then number three, we have Decidia parientalis, parientalis, like uh, parieto, parieto, uh, you know, visceral, and uh, parieto layer of, you know, those technologies. So even this one, we have Decidia parientalis, Decidia parientalis. So these are the three types of decidia, and you are expected to know the differences. You are expected to know uh, the meaning. If I say decidia desalis, you should know. Uh, decidia capsularis and decidia parentalis, you must know, and be able to describe uh, these three uh, types of decidia. So the best uh, for you to understand, uh, uh, I use the analog of planting a seed. So if you want to plant a seed, like a maize seed, for instance, okay, of course, you are going to dig a hole where you are going to plant the seed, isn't it? So you dig that hole and uh, put the seed there. Then, once you do that, then you cover the seed, isn't it? And water, of course, and then it will germinate. Now, the soil where you have uh, planted that seed can be split into three. Where the seed is sitting, after you have dug out the so you have created the hole, okay, and then where the seed is going to be placed, that is the decidia basalis, okay? So the decidia basalis is where this seed will be sitting, okay? And then the soil that you have covered, so after you cover now, you cover the seed, you cover that wall, okay? That soil on top of the seed is the decidia capsularis, is the decidia capsularis. And then the rest of the soil, which was not involved in this case, uh, which was the rest of the soil away from the seed, that is the decidia parientalis. Okay, so you see there is a picture there showing the decidia, the various types of decidia. Okay, so on slide uh, 8 and slide uh, 9. Uh, this we can see clearly if we start with uh, slide 8, you can see the decidia pesaris labeled there next to the chorion frondosa next to the chorion frondosum. That is the decidia basalis. You can just adjust it to the chorion frondosum. And then we can see the decidia capsularis surrounding the, uh, the, the, the conceptus. 
okay, mm -hmm. surrounding the conceptors. So you can see the decidia capsularis, and that's why it's called capsularis because it's like a capsule. This uh, conceptus was implanted in the endometrium, okay, so it penetrated in the endometrium, just like a seed, the way we plant a seed. So it also penetrated there. So next to it, the decidia, decidia basalis. And then the one which is surrounding it, that's the decidia capsularis. And then the rest of the decidia, uh, which is basically the endometrium of the uterus, which did not take part in this, uh, you know, penetration, uh, that is now the decidia parentalis. So you can see the decidia parentalis, that's the rest of the decidia, okay? Uh, basically, you know, bordering the uterine cavity. So if you check the picture there where it says uterine cavity, okay, so we can see the decidia, which is away from the conceptus, the rest of the decidia, okay? Now, if you check picture B on the same slide, number eight, you can see now, uh, as development progresses, as development progresses, the fetus is developing, the embryo fetus is developing, enlarging and so on, the, uh, the chorion and the amnion, of course, are also expanding. Okay, they are expanding so much that you can see now in picture B that the decidia capsularis has fused with the decidia parentalis. Have we seen that? So you can see that the decidia capsularis has fused with the decidia parentalis, except of course uh, near the internal cervical os, there is a triangular small uh, space there, that is the remaining uterine cavity. That's the remaining uterine cavity. Because now the conceptus has occupied the space in the uterus. And uh, only this small part is remaining of the uterine cavity, the, the, the space. Okay? Now this space is important uh, during labor. Uh, when labor starts, the membranes bulge into this small space. The amnion and chorion, they bulge into this small space, okay? Uh, and uh, by so doing, the membranes, as they bulge like a balloon into this space, uh, they cause the cervix to open. Okay, that bulging effect uh, is going to cause the cervix to start opening, okay? And as it does that, of course, there will be local release of prostaglandins and so on, making the cervix soft. Okay, so the cervix will thin and dilate, start dilating. Those are the dilatations you hear. No, someone is now three centimeters, four centimeters, six centimeters. It's because the cervix is expanding. Okay, later on, uh, that balloon-like uh, bulge of membranes rupture. Okay, and. Uh, uh, that is now the, you know, once there is rupture, the amniotic fluid comes out uh, as four waters, four waters. I'm sure you've heard of that term, four waters. Okay, so the membranes rupture and the amniotic fluid comes out and the woman will be drained. Okay, so I want you to appreciate the fact that the decidia capsularis uh, eventually fuses with the decidia parentalis. Okay. Uh, so that's that. If we go to the next slide, slide 9, you can see again uh, uh, the decidia is, is, is colored blue. Okay, it's colored blue, and we can see the decidia next to the chorion frondosum, uh, that is the decidia basalis. That's the decidia basalis. And we can see the one surrounding the conceptus, that's the uh, decidia capsularis. And the rest is the decidia parentalis, or the two decidia, if you want. Yeah, so uh, those are the parts. And then as pregnancy advances, we can see uh, what happens to the various cavities. Uh, I want you to appreciate the three cavities in, this, uh, in these pictures. Uh, of course, uh, 
the amnio, if we start from inside, going out from the embryo, you can see the amniotic fluid, I mean amniotic cavity, sorry, amniotic cavity, the blue, uh, the, the darker blue color, that's the amniotic cavity, okay? And then this cavity, if you look at it, okay, let's, let's first list the cavity, so that's number one, amniotic cavity. And then the next one, uh, just after amniotic cavity, we can see the chorionic cavity, chorionic cavity. And then after the chorionic cavity, the next cavity is the uterine cavity, the uterine cavity. Have we seen these three cavities? Yes. Now, I want you to tell me what happens as pregnancy advances, picture B and C, what happens to these cavities in terms of increase in size or decreasing? If we start with amniotic cavity, what does happen to it? It's increasing, isn't it? So it's increasing in size as the pregnancy advances. Okay, uh, showing you that you know amniotic fluid is accumulating more and more in this cavity as the pregnancy is advancing. Uh, that's amniotic cavity. Okay, we can see picture C. Uh, the amniotic cavity is quite quite big. Then, uh, what happens to the chorionic cavity as pregnancy advances? What's happening? If you compare chorionic cavity in A and B, what has happened to, to it? <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, so it decreases until it disappears. Okay? So you can see there uh, that the chorionic cavity uh, in A is there, but in B there is no chorionic cavity. Okay? Uh, simply, what happened here is that, remember, uh, this pregnancy is advancing. It's advancing, there is increase in these structures. And the, uh, the, the embryo fetus is expanding. So, the membranes, the amnion and chorion, the chorion and the amnion, okay, they have to fuse. Okay, if you check uh, picture C, it's labeled there on top, fused, okay, that, that one is fused, uh, decidia, parentis, uh, capsulis. But anyway, the, the amnion and the chorion, they fuse to, to more like appear as one membrane, to more like appear as one membrane, the chorion um, amnion membrane, chorion amniotic membrane, if you want. Okay, so they fuse. But at birth, after the placenta is delivered, you can easily separate the two manually. Okay, they appear as one membrane, but you can actually uh, separate the two, showing you that this uh, fusion is just a loose uh, fusion. Okay, so it's loose. And so you can easily uh, separate the two, except at the uh, umbilical cord area, insertion point, where the cord inserts in the placenta, uh, the two membranes, you can't separate them. So you can separate them uh, uh, away from the, uh, from the cord. Okay? So that is the chorionic cavity. What about the uterine cavity? Again, here I think uh, uh, already mentioned, so you can see that the uterine cavity, uh, the brown cavity there, uh, is decreasing uh, as pregnancy advances, except uh, eventually in picture C, we can see the small space, triangular space, uh, near the cervical internal pose. Okay, so this is the relation of the amniotic cavity, chronic cavity, and uterine cavity of successive stages. At the end of eighth week, picture A, uh, 10 weeks after the last period, picture B, and end of 12th week in picture C. Okay, so those are the, uh, the structures. Uh, take note of the yolk sac. Okay, yolk sac, you can see at, at the end of eighth week, the yolk sac is there, okay? But as pregnancy advances, okay, the yolk sac disappears as well. Okay, so you can see that. Um, Hope we're able to uh, appreciate the chorion frondosa 
and the corn levy from these pictures. Okay, the corn levy, the smooth part of corn, and then corn frondosa and the rough part, uh, which is adjacent to the decidia basalis, and these two fuse and form the placenta. Okay. We can proceed. So now let's look at the slide 12, structure of the placenta. Uh, basically, we go straight to the uh, uh, to, to slide 13, which shows the picture of uh, the chorionic and decidual plates of the placenta. Okay, slide 13. So that is the structure of the placenta. That's the structure of the placenta. So the placenta, we can see here that it has two plates. We have chorionic plates and decidual plates. Chorionic plates and decidual plates. And we can see that the chorionic plate lies on the internal aspect. Lies on the internal aspect and it borders the fetal side. It borders the fetal side of the placenta. Okay, are we able to appreciate that? So if you check, you can see the umbilical cord. We can see the umbilical cord uh, that is coming to the coronic plate, showing you that this cord is connecting the placenta to the fetus. The fetus. And showing you that this is the inner aspect, inner aspect of uh, the placenta. Okay? Whereas the basal plate or decidual plate, so you can also call it basal plate, it lies on the maternal aspect. The basal plate lies on the aspect. And um, on its maternal side, it is bordered by the decidia basalis. It is bordered by the decidia basalis. Okay? Showing you that two components form the placenta the decidia basalis on the maternal aspect and the chorion frondosum on the fetal aspect. Okay? You can see, so the mic is, uh, is being. Then we can see that the, on the coronic plate, on the coronic plate, be able to appreciate that it is lined by an amniotic membrane. It is lined by an amniotic membrane. We can see that thin blue line on the outside of the coronic plate. That is the amniotic membrane. That is the amniotic membrane. So the amniotic membrane covers the coronic plate. Covers the coronic plate. And that's one of the major differences between maternal and fetal portions of the placenta. <coughs> one is covered by amniotic membrane. The other one is not covered by an amniotic membrane. Okay. So uh, be able to appreciate that. Then also... Uh, be able to appreciate again just an emphasis that the umbilical cord attaches uh, to the coronic plate, attaches to the coronic plate, and not on the maternal plate. Um, uh, I mean the decidual plate, the decidual plate. So again, just to emphasize that again another important difference between the fetal and maternal portions of the placenta. The umbilical cord attaches on the fetal aspect of the placenta and not on the maternal aspect, okay? And then uh, eventually I want you to appreciate the intervillous spaces. The intervillous spaces, uh, these are the spaces between the two plates, uh, between the uh, decidual plate on the maternal side and the coronic plate on the fetal side. In between those are the intervillous spaces, the intervillous spaces where the chorionic villi dip into. Remember what I mentioned? So the chorionic villi they dip into the intervillous spaces, and they are then surrounded by maternal blood. And we can see there is uh, maternal blood there. We can see the uterine arteries, spiral branches. Uh, delivering blood into the intervillous spaces, into the intervillous spaces, and then uh, blood circulates, the maternal blood circulates within the 
intravenous spaces, and then it comes out. Uh, you can see the the veins, uh, the uterine veins collecting the maternal blood. Okay, but fetal blood, we can see the source of the fetal blood uh, in the placenta are uh, the two umbilical arteries, the blue structures in the cord. We can see the umbilical arteries taking blood which uh, has high level of carbon dioxide, low level of oxygen, with a lot of waste products from the fetus, okay, uh, going to the placenta uh, in the coronic villi, to go and circulate in the coronic villi. And then the uh, umbilical vein collects the high oxygen uh, blood uh, with the nutrients, okay, uh, from the placenta uh, to the fetus, okay, through the cord. Okay, so it's important to appreciate that. Uh, so uh, fetal blood only circulates in the chronic villa. It doesn't mix with the maternal blood because of the placental barrier. Okay, so it's important to take note. Then also take note of the, in this picture, take note of the, uh, the, the, the umbilical vesco, the one labeled umbilical vesco. That's basically the uh, yolk sac, the yolk sac. Okay, so the yolk sac uh, becomes part of the contents in the umbilical cord, in the umbilical cord, but with time it disappears. Okay. So any questions on the on the coronic and the sedial plates of the placenta in this picture? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, to the uh, placenta, yes. Yes, yes, vice versa, yes. Okay, the adult uh, after birth. what point do they do? So immediately after birth, okay, so after birth, what happens is that there is a cry, the, 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 the baby cries, okay, that, that first cry. So that first cry basically opens up the alveoli, okay, the air sacs uh, in the lungs. And so by open up, opening up the alveoli, uh, it means that the resistance uh, in the lungs reduces. Okay, so the resistance, the vascular resistance in the uh, newborn lungs reduce. Okay, in, in, in pregnancy, the fetal lungs, you know, there is high level of uh, pulmonary resistance. There's a lot of resistance, so much that very little amount of uh, blood is able to reach the fetal lungs. Okay, but after birth, uh, that resistance drastically reduces. And once it reduces, it means now when you compare the two systems, the pulmonary uh, system and the systemic system, you are going to realize that after birth, the pulmonary uh, resistance reduces. And so the pulmonary aspect, you know, will be a low pressure system, system will be a low pressure system, whereas the rest of the system, the systemic circulation, will be a high pressure system. And that's why now, the two switches, okay, so the, uh, the iota now carries uh, blood from the uh, heart to the rest of the, okay, whereas, in, and now that also, the two, when the two there is uh, that uh, uh, pressure difference, remember in the fetal heart, uh, there is an opening, there is an opening in, uh, uh, in the atria, okay, the right and left atria, there is an opening. Okay, the foramen ovale, what we call foramen ovale. So that one closes immediately after birth when the pulmonary pressure reduces, okay, and the systemic pressure increases. So it pushes and, you know, closes that, uh, uh, that opening. And so there will be no communication between the right atrium and the left atrium. And then blood will circulate like that. Okay. Okay, any other answer? 
Chorionic cavity contain any fluid during its development and disappearance? Okay, does the coronary cavity contain? Yeah, so it can, yeah, it contains uh, fluid as well, okay, but of course that fluid is not really significant. Uh, and uh, why do I say so? Because uh, remember it's also separated by membranes, okay, and uh, any membrane uh, has potential to secrete fluid, okay, it's like a serous uh, membrane. A serous membrane, one of the uh, characteristics of uh, epithelia, we remember that epithelial tissue are able to say and absorb, uh, you know, fluids, isn't it? So potentially, yes, yeah, but not significant. I think we need to proceed. Okay, so that's that. We go to uh, the next one. Okay, let's go to slide uh, 19. Slide 19, the intervillar spaces, just to again emphasize intervillar spaces. If we remember very well, intervillar spaces, these are coming from what? What makes up intervillar spaces? From um, second week development of, uh, you know, the, uh, second week development. Development in the second week. We mentioned that uh, these will be future intervenous spaces. What structures were those? I, I thought people know they, they know these things. Next week, is it next week or after next week? It's a test. Yes, sir. Yes, it's the trophoblastic lacunae. Trophoblastic lacunae spaces, okay? If we remember the trophoblastic lacunae spaces, do we remember them? Yes. Yes. Where are they found? Which part of uh, trophoblast? The syncytium, isn't it? So the syncytium, the syncytium has these trophoblastic lacunae spaces. Okay. And those spaces are the future uh, intervillar spaces. Okay. They are the future intervillar spaces where my type of blood is derived. Okay, so just to highlight, I mean to emphasize that, uh, so we can see from this picture that the intervillar spaces are lined by syncytial trophoblasts. That green color border of the intervillar space, so that green color is representing uh, syncytial trophoblasts. So you can see that is syncytial trophoblast, and then there is maternal blood being delivered by the spiral artery and taken away by the uterine veins. Okay, and uh, we can see the cytotrophoblast uh, uh, on the inner aspect. Okay, if, with reference to the capillaries. Okay, we can see the uh, fetal capillaries. Okay, if you move away from the fetal capillaries. Cytotrophoblast uh, comes after the mesoderm. You can see the mesoderm core, and then syncytial trophoblast is on the outside. Okay, so just to emphasize that. So that's why we we, we say that uh, the human placenta is hemochorial. Okay, is hemochorial because it is surrounded by maternal blood. Villi are surrounded by maternal blood. Okay, uh, slide 20 is just basically again intervillar space, just to uh, emphasize the intervillar space. Okay, now let's go to uh, slide, slide 23. Slide 23, of course I'll highlight the, the full term placenta, the features of a full term placenta, but I want you to appreciate uh, slide 23, the two surfaces of the placenta. Okay, the two surfaces of the placenta. We have the fetal and the maternal surfaces. Okay, uh, again, if you go to slide 24, it's the same. Uh, fetal versus maternal surfaces of the placenta. Maybe we can use uh, slide 24, which is more clear, so we can see there. 
That is a full term placenta. Okay, that's a full term placenta. And the two surfaces. You can see the shape already is disc. It's a disc shape. And that's why we said the placenta is discoid. It's discoid. Now, at delivery, at delivery, the placenta is supposed to be examined. You are supposed to fully examine the placenta after uh, delivery. Okay, so that you come up with some key features of the placenta. Okay, so uh, why do we do that? Uh, especially if, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe a fetus is a steel birth, okay, a uh, baby born dead and so on, then you are trying to find what could have caused the death of that fetus. And so some of uh, the information can come from the placental information when we examine the placenta. What was the weight, for instance, uh, the weight of the placenta can give you a clue to whether maybe there the are certain problems that, you know, developed during pregnancy and caused uh, the death of the fetus. Ideally, if you weigh the placenta, on average, the placenta should weigh about 500 grams. Okay, 500 grams. Okay, and uh, if you compare the fetal weight, the weight of the fetus, but you have to weigh the fetus. If you weigh the fetus, you come up with the weight, and you weigh the placenta also, you come up with the weight. The two should be weighted. The ratio of the fetal weight and placental weight, they are related. Okay, uh, the fetal weight equals six times the placental weight. The fetal weight equals six times the placental weight. Are we together? So if you say uh, y equals two, I mean uh, y equals six x. Y equals six x, where y is the fetal weight and x is the placental weight. So therefore, the ratio of the fetal weight to the placental weight is what? Huh? One to six. six to one, isn't it? Six to one. Fetal weight to the placental weight, six to one. Or if you want, you can say placental weight to fetal weight will be one to six. Okay? So you need that information. Okay? So the weight of the placenta should be six times the weight of the fetus. Now imagine, so, 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 so for instance, if uh, uh, you weigh the baby, the baby, the birth weight is, uh, let's say it's uh, three kgs. Therefore, the placental weight for that baby is expected to be about what? Come again? Five, 500 uh, grams, okay, 500 grams, isn't it? Yeah, so that, that should be the, the normal. But imagine the placenta weight is, uh, you know, 200 grams, okay, instead of 500. Then it's abnormal, it's abnormal, okay? And that can actually cause the fetus to die if the pregnancy was to continue, to continue inside, okay? It means, you, it means the placenta is insufficient to deliver more oxygen, to deliver more nutrients to the fetus. And so, if the placenta size is decreasing as the pregnancy is advancing, the fetus is at an increased risk of dying. Okay? So much that by the time uh, someone is hitting 34 weeks, 36 weeks, the baby dies inside. And that happens, for instance, in uh, smokers, okay? Uh, those who smoke, for instance, smoking is associated with reduced placental efficiency so there is placental insufficiency as time progresses okay and uh, it's a risk uh, to the fetus the fetus can die uh, uh, you know even in certain conditions like preeclampsia uh, eclampsia uh, even just pregnancy uh, chronic hypertension and so on in pregnancy those can reduce the efficiency of the placenta and the baby can die okay 
So that's that. So uh, food term placenta, so take note of the ratio, the six to one ratio, fetal weight to maternal, I mean to placental weight. Then the thickness of the placenta should be thickness of the placenta should be about three centimeters. Its diameter, you know, the diameter of the placenta at term can vary between 15 to 25 centimeters. Okay, between 15 to 25 centimeters. Now, I want you to appreciate um, differences between the fetal portion and the maternal portion. If you look at these two pictures, I mean, uh, yeah, the two slides 23 and slide 24. Okay. Um, maybe let's start with uh, 23. We can go back to slide 23. So slide 23, we can see that the fetal portion, the fetal portion of the placenta, there is an umbilical cord as a, uh, to it. There is an umbilical cord. There is no umbilical cord on the maternal portion. On the maternal portion, there is no umbilical cord. That's number one. Number two, we can see that the maternal port, I mean the fetal portion, there is an amnion. There is an amnion, that membrane. Okay? There is an amnion. And this amnion is absent. Uh, on the maternal portion. So the maternal portion is not covered by amnion. Okay? That's number two. Okay, number three. What can we see? Number three. Yes, Exactly. The fetal side, there are no cotridons. There are no cotridons on the fetal side. Cotridons are present on the maternal side. And that's why the, the maternal portion is rough compared to the fetal portion. The fetal portion is smooth. The maternal portion is rough. Rough because of the presence of cotridons. Now, cotridons are very, very important structures on the placenta. And at delivery of the placenta, you must ensure that when you examine the placenta, the placenta, the maternal portion, all of it is covered by cotridons. There should be no missing cotridon. Okay? Even one. They shouldn't be a missing cotridone. If there is a missing cotridone, it means that this cotridone is still attached to the still attached to the to the uterus, isn't it? It's still attached to the uterus. And as long as it is still attached to the uterus and still in the or even just in the cavity of the uterus, this cotridone will cause problems. It will cause bleeding, okay? Because the uterus will try to expel that cotridone. And in so doing, uh, there will be loss of blood from the uterus, okay? The uterus is a unique, uh, a unique organ, uh, so much that if there is any, uh, uh, anything that is remaining in the uterus after delivery, it will try to squeeze itself and expel expel the contents okay expect the contents even blood clots sometimes if there are still a lot of blood clots inside it will continue doing like that to expel the contents okay until the entire fetal placental unit is out until the entire fetal placental unit in totality comes out what do i mean by that what i mean is that the fetus should come out and number two, the placenta with its membranes they should come out. So if the membranes are still inside, the woman will continue breathing. So you must make sure that everything uh, uh, is out. If there is cotridone, 
still in the uterus, that's very dangerous because it will cause what we call postpartum hemorrhage. To cause postpartum hemorrhage, PPH. Okay, PPH, postpartum hemorrhage. And basically, it's loss of blood of more than 500 mules uh, in vaginal delivery or more than 1,000 mules in cesarean section. Okay? If a woman loses blood beyond 500 mils, vaginally, after birth, vaginal birth, that is what, uh, PPH, that is PPH, postpartum hemorrhage. And at uh, cesarean section, if a woman loses more than 1,000 mils, that's PPH as well. Okay? And PPH is dangerous because it can cause maternal death. The woman can die. It's one of the most common causes of uh, maternal death. Okay? So if you hear from a woman, went to, you know, labor, went to the hospital to deliver, and uh, after delivery, the woman died, most likely it is due to major hemorrhage, which uh, was not controlled. Okay? And so the woman loses life like that, just like that. That's why we discourage home deliveries, okay? Uh, in the 21st century, we should not have, you know, women delivering at home. Why? Why should a woman deliver at home during this time? No. Because that's the risk of the woman uh, life. It's life-threatening, okay? Yes, sometimes you can go out with it, the woman is okay. But should you have things like placenta accreta, accreta or pecreta at home, that's the death of the woman. Okay? So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that you must examine the placenta at birth, ensure that all the cotridones and all the membranes have come out. Okay? Uh, at birth. Should they still be inside, the woman will continue bleeding and that will cause postpartum hemorrhage okay so that's very important the next is to know that the placenta can of course uh, come out on its own even even if you don't uh, temper with it it can come out the placenta that is uh, you know normally implanted uh, after delivery of the baby uh, if you leave it to nature the placenta will come out. Maybe within 30 minutes, the placenta will come out. Okay, spontaneously on its own. Uh, that's how animals, okay, uh, animals deliver. They don't require, you know, a midwife, for instance, to be present <laughs> and deliver the placenta. No, animals just deliver. A cow will deliver on its own, and the placental tissue will come out. And sometimes the, 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 the animal can even eat that placental, uh, the placenta that has come out. Okay. A principle, some, you know, some religion, don't know whether it's religions or ethnicities, sometimes, you know, or beliefs, okay, believe, maybe I put it like that, believes, some believe in eating the placenta after, uh, after birth. Okay, we have had instances a woman is requesting for her placenta after the To go and eat. Yeah. We have never heard of such. Yeah. Some people believe in that. Okay. We strongly believe in that. Okay. Uh, and some connect it to fecundity that if one eats the placenta, uh, will be able to again conceive in future. Okay, things like that. Yeah. So the placenta can come out spontaneously on its own after about 30 minutes. But we don't wait in the outcome. But we don't wait for that in clinical practice. We don't wait for a placenta to just come out on its own. We do what we call active management of third stage of labor. Active management of third stage of labor. What we mean by that? What we mean is that you must proactively be involved in delivering the placenta. 
give oxytocin, okay, uh, a very, very important drug in the hospital, in the maternity section, uh, this oxytocin will cause the uterus to contract. And when the uterus contracts, the breathing reduces drastically. Okay, within a short period of time, you see the effect of oxytocin on the uterus. The uterus will contract. Okay, and then once it has contracted, uh, you then uh, put your hand on the fundus of the uterus with your palm facing uh, facing the, 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 the woman, okay? And then your other hand uh, will, uh, of course, uh, try now to pull uh, the placenta out, vagina, okay? So you clamp the cord with the forcep, and then you start pulling, uh, your right hand is pulling the, uh, the umbilical cord, uh, basically providing the traction to uh, make sure that the placenta uh, is coming out. And then your other hand is grasping on the fundus of the uterus with the palm facing the, the woman so that as you do like this, there is counter traction, there is counter traction uh, to the pulling uh, of the placenta vagina. Don't provide counter traction. Uh, uh, there is a risk that you may, you know, pull the placenta to get with the uterus out of the vagina, okay? And so the uterus can invent what we call an invented uterus. Okay, remember it's a hollow organ, so if you pull it without counter-traction, uh, the middle on top there, it can do like this, get the point? Okay, so it can uh, invent. Come, imagine such a thing happen. That's again another complication, especially where the cord is short and you are pulling on like that. Okay, can cause uterine invasion, which will risk again the woman uh, to PPH. So, if you do active management of third stage of labor by giving oxytocin and controlled cord traction, uh, you are likely to deliver the placenta within five minutes. So you would have reduced uh, the duration from 30 minutes to less than 5 minutes. The placenta will be out. And so it means even the bleeding, you have uh, uh, reduced the blood loss. Okay. Yes. Can the placenta... Uh -huh. Being born what? Blue. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, so that, those are the effects, yes. So a blue, uh, a blue baby, for instance, basically means that uh, uh, there is a reduced amount of oxygen circulating, uh, circulating. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I was uh, in the process of answering that one. So a blue uh, appearance of uh, the the placenta. I mean the the baby. So when the baby is born blue, uh, it's because of uh, you know uh, oxygen levels in the the oxygen levels in the in the baby is reduced. Okay. So if there is reduction in the oxygen levels uh, in the baby, the baby will appear blue. And uh, we call it cyanosis, that is cyanosis. So cyanosis uh, could be due to several causes, okay? Uh, but of course, eventually, it's a reduction in oxygen levels. Yeah, there was another hand, yes? Is that any possibility whereby the child can be born in? A child can be born in? <laughs> no, 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 but, uh, not in the placenta per se. Sometimes, uh, I don't know whether that's what you mean, but sometimes, you know, remember that the placenta, the normal implantation of the placenta is near the fundus, either anterior or posterior, isn't it? And uh, in most cases, it's where? Anterior or posterior? Huh? Where is it? 
in most cases. Yes, we know that it can be anterior or posterior near the fungus, but one is more than the other. So which one is more than the other? Oh, I'll reserve that for a name <laughs> uh, So it's the posterior, so posterior, okay? Now, if the placenta has uh, implanted on the anterior aspect, okay, on the anterior aspect, and it's a uh, placenta previa, okay? Placenta previa meaning low-lying placenta, so it's anterior, but not near the fundus, but near the cervix. Okay, it's on the cervix side. If you are delivering by cesarean section, okay, if you cut the uterus, you you will be greeted by the placenta. Okay, uh, remember we cut on the lower part of the uterus, not on the upper part. So we cut on the lower part. So since this placenta is anterior and it's low lying. So when you cut like that, the first thing that appears is a placenta, okay? And so you can deliver the baby through the placenta like that. So you just poke, poke through the placenta and go and uh, get the baby out. I don't know whether that's what you mean, but uh, if you mean the other way, then no. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we need to progress. <laughs> yes, so the cotridons, very important. We need to know that the cotridons are on the maternal aspect of the placenta and not on the fetal portion. Then the next characteristic, if you go to uh, slide 24, which is more clearer, you can see that the fetal portion, we can see that it has these vessels uh, coming out from the uh, umbilical cord. We can see the vessels. So there is this ramification, what we call ramification. So there is ramification of the chorionic vessels. There is ramification of the chorionic vessels. Okay. And uh, uh, these features are basically summarized uh, uh, on the table. Uh, slide 25. So there's a table, uh, slide 25. Okay, so you can see the various features. The fetal surface is smooth, no cotridons, no grooves, umbilical cord that touches there, covered by an amniotic membrane, and there is a ramification of the umbilical vessels, if you want, or the coronic vessels. Okay, so that's that. So those are the uh, uh, contrasting features. So you can be given a table to contrast, okay, uh, the features of the uh, two surfaces of the placenta, fetal versus uh, maternal surface. And I expect people to be able to tabulate uh, these uh, differences. Just 10 marks, very simple, isn't it? <laughs> okay, we proceed further to circulation of blood in the placenta circulation of blood in the placenta. And let's go to slide 30. Circulation of blood in the placenta. So we must know that if you are given a question like that, discuss the circulation of blood in the placenta. Do not only describe one circulation you need to describe two secretions there. There is a secretion from the fetus to the placenta, and there is a secretion from the mother to the placenta, isn't it? Yes. So, therefore, we have the fetal placental secretion, that is from the fetus to the placenta, fetal placental secretion, and you also have the utero placental circulation, utero from the uterus, the uterus of the mother. So utero placental circulation. So there are two circulations within the placenta, and you must be able to describe uh, these two. 
So we can start with the utero placental circulation. Utero placental circulation. So, uh, utero placental circulation, the circulation of blood from the uterus to the placenta. This blood comes from where? From the uh, uh, mother's heart, of course. The mother's heart, if you want, you can describe all the way. Uh, the way these vessels are connected from the fetal, I mean, from the mother, mother's heart all the way up to the uterus, if you want, if you know that anatomy, you can describe, uh, you know, from the, I mean, from the uh, maternal heart, you know, through the uh, uh, iota, okay, uh, left ventricle pumping into the iota, iota taking the blood to the uh, iliac vessels, a common iliac. Uh, the uh, internal iliac and eventually the uterine artery. Okay? Now, if you don't want to go through that, you can just say uh, blood, uh, uh, blood to the placenta from the mother uh, is delivered via the uterine arteries. Okay? The uterine arteries. So the uterine arteries, they, you know, they divide subsequently Okay, eventually to give what we call spiral arteries. Okay, spiral arteries. From the uterine, the uterine artery divides repeatedly uh, to give what we call radio arteries, radio arteries to basal arteries, basal arteries to spiral arteries. But it's the spiral artery that you need to remember, the spiral artery. So you can leave uh, radio and the, the basal arteries if you want. Just say, uterine arteries through the spiral arteries to the placenta okay to the placenta now in the placenta where exactly it's the intervenous spaces so the spiral arteries deliver blood in the intervenous spaces okay and then that is maternal blood you must emphasize that this is maternal blood in the intervenous spaces so it's delivered like that, and uh, through a steering effect, eventually uh, it is drained via the uterine veins back to the mother. Okay, by steering effect, I mean if you are making a uh, zigoro, for instance, okay, you put sugar in the, in, the, in, the, in the cup, okay, in the water with cup, and then you steer that uh, uh, like that. Okay, so there's also a steering effect produced by the pulsations of the vessels, the capillaries, the fetal capillaries. Remember the fetal capillaries in the chronic villi, they are deep in the maternal uh, intervillous, in, in the intervillous spaces. So as the vessels are pulsating, they are creating a steering effect. And eventually, uh, the blood in the intervillous space will be collected by the uterine veins back to the mother. So that is the uterine placental circulation. We have about maybe uh, 100 to 200 spikes that is delivering blood in the intervillous spaces. Okay. Now the total volume of blood in the intervillous spaces, the maternal blood in the intervillous spaces is around 150 mils. Okay, 150 mils. So the total amount of blood in the intervillous spaces 150 mils. Whereas the one that is contained in the uh, colonic villi, which is uh, the other uh, circulation, 350, 350 mils. So in total, the placenta, a full term placenta, holds about 500 mils. A full term placenta holds about 500 mils. 150 mils is maternal blood in the intervillous spaces. The 350 mules is the fetal blood in the chorionic vein. Okay, that's uh, that. So when you deliver a placenta, you must know that it's containing blood, that placenta. It's 500 mules. 150 maternal, 350 uh, fetal blood. Okay, so that is the uterine placental circulation. Then we come to. Um, now, before we, we leave this uterine placental circulation, I want you to uh, take notes of slide, uh, slide 
33. Slide 33. We can see here, this is based on the conversion of spiral arteries uh, into what we call the uteroplacental arteries. Okay, conversion of spiral arteries uh, into uteroplacental arteries. We can see uh, on the far left at implantation, <coughs> at implantation, we can see the shape of the spiral artery. And that's why it's called spiral artery, because it's like a spiral. Okay, so spiral artery. Okay, we can see the shape there. And uh, you should be able to appreciate the myometrium. Okay, that uh, uh, area, that's the myometrium, meaning showing you that this is the side of the marrow. That's the side of the marrow. So you can see a spiral artery penetrating the myometrium, going to deliver its blood in the intervenous space. So meaning that the intervenous space is this side, uh, where the, eventually the spiral artery is going to deliver blood. Okay. Now we can see the decidia, okay, the basal plate of placenta and decidia, we can see there. So that's the side of the placenta, okay, and uh, of course the intervenous space. Now this is at implantation. Look at uh, the next uh, shape of the spiral artery, okay, uh, the one in the middle. We can see that now that shape of spiral has changed to funnel more like a funnel shape. Okay, are we able to appreciate that? So that is like a funnel shape. Okay, and this funnel shape is reaching the decidual myometrial junction. Decidual myometrial junction. Okay, so you can see at that junction of the decidia with the myometrium, that's where the shape uh, is ending. Okay, in this picture. So it tells you that the spiral artery, uh, week by 12th week, that is the shape of the spiral artery, by 12th week. And then, furthermore, if we go to the next one, uh, between 12th and 16th week, we can see now that the funnel shape has extended, okay, deeper into the myometrium. Have we seen that? So the funnel shape is now bigger than uh, than at 12th week. Okay, so that's that. Now again, this does not uh, go beyond a certain limit. That's the normal implantation I'm talking about. So this there is a limit to how deep uh, this invasion can can reach. Okay, there is a limit, and that limit is basically. Uh, caused by the NK cells, the NK cells within the myometrium. Okay? So there is uh, 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 the, uh, the limitation there provided by the NK cells so that this, this trophoplastic invasion does not go beyond the myometrium to reach the perimetrium and beyond. Okay? So uh, there is something that is blocking this further uh, uh, invasion of the trophoblast. So basically what has happened here is uh, uh, that there is trophoblastic invasion of the spiral arteries. The spiral arteries, okay, because they are arteries, uh, uh, a vessel has three layers, okay? Uh, I don't know how far we have gone in uh, histology. Uh, practicals, but the <laughs> yeah. So uh, the spiral, the vessel has three layers. We have tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica adventitia. Now the tunica media has smooth muscles. The tunica media of a blood vessel has smooth muscles, the vascular smooth muscle, which cause contraction and therefore constriction of a blood vessel. And if they relax, the vessel will dilate, okay, vasodilatation. Now, in the trophoblastic invasion of a spiral artery, so that we convert it to a uteroplacental artery with a funnel shape, okay, 
what is happening here is that there is uh, replacement of the tunica media. That tunica media is replaced by trophoblastic cells. So the tunica media will not be there. And therefore, it means that the smooth muscles will be absent in that uh, locality where there is invasion. And if there is no smooth muscle, it means the vessel will dilate. And so it will dilate, become flaccid, and become funnel shaped. Because there is no muscle to uh, make it spiral uh, in that spiral shape. So this is what you see here. So it means that the smooth muscles have been replaced by trophoblastic uh, uh, cells, and therefore there is um, uh, flaccidity uh, in the vessel, and the vessel dilates like that. And the importance of this uh, conversion is so that more maternal blood can be delivered to the intravenous spaces. More maternal blood should be delivered to the intravenous spaces. If you compare uh, at implantation, the spinal artery implantation, and at 12th week, if you compare these two, the one in the middle and the first one, so if you compare these two, if you imagine your physics, okay, uh, which vessel will deliver more blood between, uh, let's say, uh, the one on the left is A, let's say it's A, B, C there, A, B, C. So between A and B, which vessel will deliver more, uh, more blood? It will be B, isn't it? Okay, it's the same principle. If you have a horse pipe, okay, two horse pipes, one has no funnel at the end, the other one you connect a funnel, and then you compare the two in terms of how much uh, water will be delivered. Okay, you will realize that uh, in B, where there is a funnel, you know, there will be more delivery compared to, to, to the one without a funnel. However, the, the two, if you compare the two, there is no significant difference Okay, now that is the research. So in the research, uh, there, are, there are what we call significances. Is it a significant difference or not? So if you compare the, the two, yes, there is a difference, but the difference is not significant. It's, it's like uh, we have uh, two students, one gets uh, uh, 69% in a test, the other one gets 60%. Is there a significant difference? No. <laughs> there is no significant difference. So don't even celebrate. If you get 69, your other friend gets 60. You are in the same band. It's a B. Okay? There is no significant difference. That's exactly what is there. So in A and B, yes, the difference is there, but it's not significant. That's why we need the second trophoblastic invasion around 16th, uh, 16th to 18th week to convert that uh, funnel in B into a deeper funnel shape, which is going to have significant difference now okay, in delivering blood into the intervenous spaces. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's that. So we want more blood to be delivered to intravenous spaces. Okay. So uh, the net effect is that there will be an increase in the blood flow uh, into the intravenous spaces. We go to slide uh, uh, slide 35 is the accreta, 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 which I've already highlighted. But I want you to go to slide uh, 36. Slide 36, we can see the two pictures. And we can see that in A, okay, let's say the, the one on the left is A. We can see that in A, uh, there is endovascular trophoblasts invading spiral artery. So we can see those cells invading a spiral artery all the way up to the uh, the decidio myometrial junction, 
Okay, the syndrome of mitral junction, you can see it's there. Okay, and the shape, you can see the funnel shape uh, extending like that. Okay, but if you go to B, on the right, we can see that the trophoblastic invasion, yes, it started, but it didn't go beyond uh, uh, beyond the, 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 the decidual area. So it's still within the decidual, in fact, in the decidual. Uh, are we able to see that? So, if you compare A and B, in terms of delivery of blood, A will deliver more blood significantly than B. Okay, than B. And therefore, if there is a reduction in the delivery of blood into the intervillous spaces, eventually this can cause uh, problems. Problems like preeclampsia. You can see there, it's written down there, preeclampsia. Okay? So, preeclampsia is a condition where the placenta is not receiving enough, uh, enough blood from the mother. It's not receiving enough blood from the mother. And if an organ does not receive enough blood, what will happen to it? To its cells? Its cells are able to, I mean, are going to undergo ischemic changes. Okay, is ischemic, ischemia, what we have, ischemia. Basically, reduction in blood flow to an organ. And so the cells can undergo ischemia, and uh, this can even uh, further uh, go to necrosis, cell necrosis. Basically, more like the cells are dying. Okay, more like the cells are dying. So, cell necrosis. Now, in preeclampsia, if such a thing happens, these cells are going to secrete substances, okay? They are going to secrete substances. And these substances will go to uh, the maternal secretion and cause, you know, vasoconstriction constriction uh, the entire woman, the vessels of the entire woman uh, in various organs, including vital organs, okay? So there will be vaso constriction. And if this happens, what will happen is that, uh, you know, this woman now will be at an increased risk of hypertension in pregnancy. So there will be BP, uh, the BP will rise, there will be hypertension, and then there will be uh, organ damage. The kidneys uh, will die, uh, or rather will, will be defective at the level of the barrier, okay? And so the woman, if you check her urine, there will be protein in urine, okay, there will be proteinuria, hypertension, and so on. And uh, many complications to the brain, to the liver, to the lungs, and so on. And the woman can actually die, okay? Very dangerous uh, condition in pregnancy. The woman develops preeclampsia, and just deliver the woman. The cause is uh, the fit, I mean the placenta. The cause is the placenta. The placenta did not implant nicely. It's like you implanting seeds uh, on soil that you didn't prepare nicely, okay? Uh, you didn't put manure, okay? You are not watering that uh, soil, uh, but you have planted the seed. Yes, because of occasional watering and so on, uh, the seeds will germinate, but you see the growth of the, uh, the plants that eventually they will show that uh, there's something wrong, okay? So they wither and so they become yellow and you know, they start dying. That's exactly what happens in the preeclampsia. It means the placenta did not implant nicely, and this pregnancy now is dying. It's basically dying, okay? And in the process of dying, it's, uh, you know, secreting chemicals that are dangerous to the mother, uh, which may lead to the death of the mother. And so you intervene by delivering the placenta. But you can't deliver the placenta without delivering the baby. So you have to deliver the baby also. Regardless of the gestation, whether it's at 28 weeks, uh, whether it's at 32 weeks, okay, even if the baby is premature, okay, with a poor prognosis afterwards, okay, it's just deliver because you are interested in the mother, not the fetus. Okay. So that's that. Um, we go to C. 
slide 44, just to highlight there, placental aging, placental aging. I heard uh, people sometimes say, no, my pregnancy reached 12 months. Huh? 12 months. <laughs> How can a, plus, I mean, uh, a pregnancy reach 12 months? The most uh, common cause for that is basically wrong dates. It means you didn't count properly. <laughs> yes, wrong dates. It's the most common cause. It's wrong dates. Your count was incorrect. And so you came up to 12 months. Okay? Because the placenta has a lifespan. The placenta has a lifespan beyond which it will degenerate, die, and the fetus will die. And when the fetus dies, there are chemicals that stimulate labor to start, and you deliver uh, a dead fetus. Okay? So, uh, the placenta ages with time. So it ages. Okay? And we can see, uh, I think there should be some pictures. Yeah, so you can see slide 45 showing you the, uh, you know, uh, a transverse section pillars in the term. Okay, so you can see there, transverse section. And uh, look at the cytotrophoblast cells. Okay, the cytotrophoblast, if you compare in A and B, in B there are space. Okay, so space cytotrophoblast, you can see there. It's because there is aging, there is aging of the coronic villi, and so uh, even the efficiency to exchange substances across the placental barrier will be defective. Okay, and so oxygen uh, will be reduced in terms of how much is being exchanged. Okay, the nutrients, how much they are being exchanged, will be reduced, and so the woman can actually uh, lose the pregnancy beyond that. Okay, so people have started going out, I also go. Yes, and leave the rest to yourself. Okay, uh, we go to the functions. The functions are already highlighted, uh, slide 47. are already highlighted there. Uh, but just let me to highlight the immunological, immunological function. Uh, that one is to do with uh, the antibodies, okay, the antibodies, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, blood group incompatibility, like recess incompatibility. I'm sure you have heard of uh, uh, the uh, hemolytic disease of the newborn, okay, uh, hemolytic disease of the newborn and fetus, sometimes uh, it can be immune-mediated, okay, immune cause, okay, of course, others can be because of non-immune, nothing to do with the immune system, but sometimes it can be due to the immune system. For instance, if a woman is recess negative, okay, recess negative, if a woman is, uh, that's why we screen, we screen at the booking visit, if a woman comes uh, for the first time, antenatal, you have to screen, and one of the things we screen is the mother's blood group. Okay, so if the mother is A negative, for instance, A negative, O negative, as long as there is a negative, that negative is representing the recess group. Okay. The recess, it means that that patient, uh, that person has a recess negative group. Most people have the positive. 85 of 85% of individuals, they are recess positive, but about you know 15 percent they are negative now that dresses negative in a woman of reproductive age and is pregnant is not good okay and so that woman needs a proper follow-up so that uh, you know uh, you manage uh, the woman so that she does not become iso immunized iso immunization to prevent iso immunization okay by that I mean she doesn't become hypersensitive, okay? So the hypersensitivity reaction should take place, okay? How can it take place? It can take place if 
uh, the developing conceptors, the embryo fetus, is rhesus positive. If a rhesus negative mother is carrying a rhesus positive embryo and fetus, that's dangerous. Okay? That's dangerous. Because we all know that immunoglobulin G are able to cross the placenta, isn't it? Yes. So the IgG from the mother will cross the placenta, will go to the developing fetus blood. And that is incompatible because the uh, embryo and fetus is positive. Okay? And so what will happen is that the red, or rather the fetal red blood cells, okay? The fetal red blood cells, uh, uh, they, they can be destroyed. They can be destroyed, especially in the future pregnancy. If it's a first pregnancy, a first pregnancy is more like uh, um, it's safe, it's safe, okay? Unless the subsequent pregnancy, where now the woman has what? Has these antibodies, okay? Antibodies against the rhesus positive group. In the first pregnancy, the IgG from the mother has crossed, has gone to the uh, to the fetus. There is a reaction that has occurred there, and in the process of delivery, in the process of delivery, uh, the fetal blood. Imagine the fetal blood mixing with the maternal blood at birth. Okay, be it at birth or miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, if there is any chance, even at a blood transfusion. Imagine they give you, you are rhesus negative, but they give you rhesus positive group. It means you are going to be sensitized. Okay, so the first time, yes, you won't see the effect, but the effect will be seen in the subsequent events. And so this woman, once there is fetal maternal hemorrhage, uh, in the subsequent pregnancy, she is going to have the antibodies against the positive uh, group. And so, the subsequent pregnancy uh, uh, will be destroyed. So to say, the red blood cells of that embryo and fetus will be destroyed. Because now, the ones which are crossing from the mother to the fetus, they are antibodies against the rhesus positive group. Okay? And so there will be uh, hemolysis of the red blood cells in the fetus, uh, severe anemia in the fetus will develop, and then there will be heart failure in the fetus, and the fetus will develop uh, edema and so on, and will swell, eventually can even die if you don't intervene. That's why this woman who is rhesus negative should be given uh, anti-D immunoglobulin at 28 weeks, uh, at 34 weeks, and within 72 hours after delivery. Okay, they need to have those injections, so it, uh, immunoglobulin D. Okay, uh, so that to prevent sensitization, to prevent sensitization, you have to give them a drug in the form of uh, anti-D immunoglobulin. Okay, so that one uh, is a highlight. Is uh, you need to know that one. So the rest of the slides on the functions, they are just you know uh, details on the on the functions. So I'll skip that. We'll go to. Yeah, so basically the erythroblastosis vitalis or hemolytic disease, uh, fetal eye drops, that one is what I was describing. Slide 58, the clinical correlates, uh, that's what I was just explaining. We go to slide 60, abnormalities of placental shape. We can see that sometimes the placenta can assume different shapes. Okay? You can have, for instance, an, an accessory placenta. Okay? An accessory placenta. We can see if you look very closely uh, on the picture on the picture on the left, you can see that on the far left there is a placental tissue, okay, that is um, attached to the main placenta, to the main placenta with a narrow stalk. Have you seen that one? Yeah, so we can see a narrow uh, red part, uh, the, the narrow red tissue or brownish tissue connecting a succulent 
or an accessory placenta to the rest of the placenta. <coughs> okay, and you can see the membranes uh, uh, on the periphery, okay, with the, uh, an empty spaces, those black spaces uh, in between. Okay, so uh, this is uh, an accessory placenta. And sometimes uh, when you deliver this woman, the main placenta may come out, but the acc uh, accessory placenta is still inside. Okay, and that will be dangerous. It's like a missing country dog, for instance. Uh, the, uh, the explanation again, so it will be PPH. So you must just ensure that everything has come out. Okay? And then if you check uh, the picture on the right, we can see there is a pyrope placenta. That's a pyrope placenta or pyrope sometimes called pyrope placenta or bipartite, bipartite placenta. Okay? We can see the whitish uh, tissue in the middle. That's basically uh, an umbilical cord. Okay? Umbilical cord attachment. And uh, we can see uh, the almost equal proportions uh, the placental tissue, uh, uh, placental tissue. So that's a uh, bipartite. So the point I'm trying to say here is that the placenta sometimes can assume different shapes. Okay, and uh, it's important to be aware of these shapes. We go now. We are done with the placenta. We now go to the membranes. <coughs> to the membranes, fetal membranes. The amnion and uh, chorion. The amnion and chorion. So, uh, you must know that the chorion is on the outside. Okay, if we were to go back to the pictures which were showing the uterine cavities, uh, how they increase in size, some, some uh, you know, disappearing. If you go back to that picture, you will see that the chorion, uh, the chorion is outside and the amnion is inside. Okay, the chorion, I've already uh, described the chorion, the chorion levy, chorion frondosum, which one takes part in formation of the placenta, which uh, one doesn't take uh, part, and so on the reasons why. Okay, but it's the amnion that uh, uh, I didn't uh, emphasize. So the amnion is uh, an important uh, inner layer of uh, fetal membranes, okay? Why is it important? Uh, because it has a number of functions. It has a number of functions, okay? The amnion has a number of functions. And one function is, of course, production of amniotic fluid. So it contributes to the production of amniotic fluid, okay? The fluid around uh, the developing embryo, the developing uh, fetus uh, because it has amnioblast cells, amnioblast cells which produce uh, amniotic fluid. Apart from that, uh, the, the, amnion, uh, the amnion is able to secrete uh, prostaglandins. Okay? Prostaglandins are basically chemicals uh, that, you know, during labor can help to direct uh, the cervix, to make the, the uh, the cervix, uh, uh, you know, uh, are soft, okay, to make the, the cervix soft, okay, from hard to soft. It can soften the cervix and uh, thin the cervix and then dilate it, okay, what we call uh, soft consistency, okay. Later on, there is what we call effacement, which is basically thinning. So if the cervix was What's the normal length of the cervix? So the cervix is about three to four centimeters. Three to four centimeters. Okay, and sometimes uh, women, some women can have a shorter cervix, less than 2.5 centimeters, for instance. Okay, a shorter cervix is, uh, you know, a shorter cervix carries a risk of uh, uh, what we call uh, cervical insufficiency or cervical weakness, okay? And so uh, when the uh, embryo and fetus is developing inside the uterus and it's increasing size, uh, increasing the, the size of the pregnancy, uh, sometimes this shorter cervix can 
can give way and uh, the woman prematurely loses the pregnancy, especially around the mid second trimester. Okay, mid second trimester in the 20th, uh, between 20 uh, to 28th week, in the middle there, 22 weeks, 23, 24. Okay, somewhere there, they lose the pregnancy. Okay, uh, just see that the uh, the membranes rupture and uh, you know draining starts and uh, you know pregnancy comes out without pain, painless. Okay, and so that is uh, cervical insufficiency or cervical weakness because of a shorter cervix. Okay, a shorter cervix, less than 2.5 centimeters. And once a woman has had this history, in the subsequent pregnancy when she she she, she comes for antenatal you must book this woman uh, for cervical secretion, okay? So that you press the secretion, uh, you suture the secretion, you tie the cervix, okay? Uh, uh, so that it doesn't open when it reaches, uh, uh, you know, uh, mid second trimester. And so the pregnancy will go beyond uh, beyond that and reach ten. And at that eight weeks, you uh, remove the secretion because any time the woman will go into labour. Okay, the woman should not have a secret at the time of labor because that's very dangerous. So when it starts, you remove the secret even if the woman has not reached it, eight weeks. Okay, if you press a, a cervical secret and labor starts maybe at 30th week, just remove the, uh, the secret. Cut it because if you don't, uh, remember this uterus is contracting, trying to push out the fetal placental unit. And as it does this, it's like a balloon, okay? And so it can rupture at, at any time, okay? The uterus can rupture at any time. Uh, to just uh, uh, remove the fetal placental unit from the area of weakness, okay? From the area of weakness. And so, just find this woman ruptures. And uh, we, uh, that is a very dangerous uh, condition because uh, the blood loss will be more. The woman will lose blood. And that blood will correct in the abdomen, the abdominal cavity. So if you go and open the abdomen, you just find blood all over. And uh, this uh, fetus and the uh, placenta may be out of the uterus. Okay, you just find the fetus in the uh, abdominal cavity. Okay, so that's that like floating the blood. Very dangerous. Okay, so that's that. Now, uh, the amnion, this uh, amnion is able to secrete uh, those uh, prostaglandins, you know, has got uh, enzymes, okay, uh, for steroid uh, hormonal metabolism, and then of course uh, can facilitate, uh, uh, and then number two, their intact membranes prevent ascending infection. That's very important also to highlight, okay, an intact amnion, okay, uh, will prevent infection from reaching the the fetus, okay, because uh, it is protective surrounding the fetus, okay. That's why if a woman is draining, it means that there is a break in the membranes. There is a break in the membranes, the amnion. There is a break in the amnion, and that's why you're able to see this amniotic fluid coming out. Now that break can be an entry point for infection. That can be an entry point of infection. Remember that the vagina has what we call normal flora. Okay, normal flora. Uh, and this normal flora can ascend uh, to the cervix, can ascend to the membranes. And so if there is uh, any break in the amnion, uh, this bacteria can enter the, the sac and it causes what we call chorioamnionitis. Okay, inflammation of the chorion and uh, abdomen. And uh, eventually, the fetus will be infected as well. Uh, so much that at the time of birth, this fetus is going to have sepsis, neonatal sepsis, and so on, meningitis. Okay? So, a very dangerous condition. The chorioamnionitis uh, is dangerous to the mother as well. The mother can die because of infection in the uh, sac. Okay? Yeah. So, we need to know that an intact uh, amnion is protective against ascending infection, against ascending infection from the vagina. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, 
Um, amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid. For amniotic fluid, let's go to the, the schema. Um, yeah, slide 67. Source and circulation of amniotic fluid. So this scheme is showing the source and circulation of amniotic fluid. We can say that uh, there is amniotic fluid in the center of the skin, and we can see the sources of this amniotic fluid. So one of the sources is transudation from the placenta. Okay, we can see there, transudation. Okay, then we can see that uh, the maternal circulation, okay, uh, can contribute through the amniotic epithelium, the amnioblast, okay, contribute the secretion of amniotic fluid into the sac. And also, we can see on the far right, fetal skin. Uh, fetal skin is able to contribute amniotic fluid uh, uh, in the sac before the skin is keratinized. Okay, before the skin is keratinized. Remember that the skin has uh, an epidermis. The epidermis of the skin uh, is keratinized, isn't it? So, keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, now the keratinization happens from 20th week onwards. Okay, so before 20th week of intrauterine life, the skin is non keratinized. And so it will be able to secrete fluid, and that fluid will add volume to amniotic fluid. So it's a source. But after 20th week, there will be no secretion of fluid into the, uh, the, the sac. Now, the important uh, contribution comes from fetal urine. Fetal urine. Uh, we can see that uh, about 600 to 1,000 uh, to twice that, uh, that, that, that volume, 600 to 1,200 mules to urine, you know, uh, gets into uh, the amniotic sac, okay? So the fetus basically urinates into the sac, okay? And the majority of that fluid in the sac is fetal urine, okay? So if you are in labor ward and uh, you are, you know, delivering this woman, okay, and uh, uh, maybe accidentally the amniotic fluid splashes on you, including the face. <laughs> yeah, so it can splash. You okay, just know that that's fetal urine. Okay? <laughs> that's fetal urine. Yeah. So the fetus, uh, you know, urinates into the sac, and the majority of the fluid is based on fetal urine. <clears throat> That's why if the fetus has problems with urination, then the fluid is going to reduce than normal, a condition we call oligohydramnios. Oligohydramnios. So there is oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios. Okay? Polyhydramnios, also you can call it hydramnios. Hydramnios. Okay? So uh, if the amount of amniotic fluids is lower than normal, that is oligohydramnios. And we have indices we use to measure the volume of amniotic fluid. You can do what we call a, a single vertical pool. Okay, a single vertical pool. So on scan, when they are scanning the pregnancy, the sonographer will give uh, maybe the deepest vertical pool is uh, six centimeters. Okay, or five centimeters or 8 centimeters, or 10 centimeters, or 2 centimeters, or 1 centimeter. So the single vertical pool. That one, the normal should be between 2 to 8 centimeters. That's normal, 2 to 8 centimeters. You are just going for the deepest vertical pool with a lot of fruit. You can divide the uterus into four quadrants. You can into four quadrants. So measure here, measure there, measure there, measure there. Okay? And you get the deepest vertical pool. That will be your reference. 
If you don't want the symbol of vertical pool, you can sum up all these centimeters. If here it was two centimeters, here it was one centimeter, here it was four, here it was six, you sum up all of them and come up with what we call amniotic fluid index. Amniotic fluid index. The normal should be between five to 25 centimeters. Five to 25 centimeters. So that will be given on the scan. So if you see a scan of a pregnant mother, there is, you know, uh, measurements of amniotic fluid. They will measure the amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid adequate, uh, and the single vertical pool being uh, seven centimeters or being uh, five centimeters, they will measure those things. They will be there. Okay, so you as uh, a clinician, you should be able to interpret uh, the reports. Okay. So that's that. So what about, um, so remember, it circulates like that, so the contribution, but how does it get absorbed? How does uh, it get absorbed? Uh, but before that, we should also know that the, you should also know that the fetal lungs also contributes to the uh, amniotic fluid volume, the fetal lungs, just that I think they haven't shown, shown the key. So the fetal lungs, the fluid that comes out from there also, you know, uh, contributes to the amniotic uh, fluid. Now, how does the amniotic fluid get absorbed? Most of this fluid is swallowed by the fetus. So the fetus swallows the amniotic fluid. Okay. <laughs> I <have> water. <laughs> so it swallows, urinates, swallows, urinates, swallows, majority of the amniotic fluid circulates like that, okay? And that's why you find that if a fetus is not able to swallow the fluid, for instance, in conditions like anencephaly, okay, or spinal bifida and so on, uh, where the swallowing reflex is defective, there is no swallowing, then it means that the fluid will continue accumulating in the sac and it will go beyond the normal limit. And so, can have polyhydramnias. Or if there is a, you know, osophageal, uh, osophageal atresia, or even duodenal atresia, or stenosis, okay, uh, you know, reducing the swallowing amount of volume, okay, then again, that can contribute to polyhydramnias. There was a hand. And the baby drums. The baby drums. Uh, no, if uh, uh, you know, if it's still in the uterus, you can't really say the baby can drown uh, because you know this amniotic fluid is where the, the, the baby is. Okay, so it's like uh, you know this baby is deep in the in the fluid. Okay. But maybe what you are trying to say is uh, at the time of birth, okay, at the time of birth where uh, the, 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 the baby is coming out and uh, that first cry, uh, if you are not careful, that first cry, you can have, you know, this amniotic fluid being, uh, you know, inspirated, uh, being inspirated through the mouth or through the nostril. And uh, if it's a fluid that uh, uh, had uh, meconium, meconium, meconium is the stool of the fetus, okay, the stool of the fetus. So if, uh, and this stool can be fresh or old stool, if it's fresh stool, fresh meconium, uh, it's a sign of fetal distress, uh, meaning the, 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 the oxygen amount going to the fetus is reduced, and so it's like you, they tie you around the neck, okay, they tie you around the neck tightly to block air from entering your lungs, uh, definitely you are going to be distressed, isn't it? And eventually your sphincters will open, including the anal sphincter, and uh, feces will come out. That's exactly what happens also for the fetus in the, in the uterus. If there is fetal distress, okay, no enough oxygen to the fetus, uh, the, 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 the sphincters will open, including the anal sphincter for the fetus, and this meconium will, will come out from the anus into the and mix with the amniotic fluid. Okay, so that fluid, uh, now when there is meconium, 
uh, when there is meconium and then the fetus, well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it inspirates that uh, meconium into the lungs. That's very dangerous. Okay, very dangerous because uh, that meconium goes to block the alveoli, blocks the alveoli, and therefore blocks uh, gaseous exchange. Okay, and so this baby will have respiratory distress. Okay, meconium aspiration syndrome, very dangerous. Okay, so that's that. So yes, so most of this uh, uh, fluid is swallowed. Okay, swallowed by the uh, fetus. Um, yeah, so in the next slide, 68, uh, is mentioning something with meconium. We can see the meconium stains and so on. So different colors can be assumed. The fresh meconium is green and the old meconium is yellow, okay, yellowish. Okay, uh, like savon, uh, the color of savon. Have you seen savon? Yeah, or that dental liquid soap. Okay, the similar one. Okay, that's old meconium. If the amniotic fluid is colored like that, that's old meconium. But if it's green, that's fresh. And fresh meconium means you have to act. Okay, so if you rupture the membranes and the fluid that is coming out is greenish fluid. That's fresh meconium, showing you that the, the baby is in distress, okay? And uh, there is reduced amount of oxygen going to the fetus. And if you don't intervene, the fetus will die. And so it's an emergence, and you deliver that baby by cesarean section. Emergence, cesarean section. So you take to theater so that the baby comes out uh, quickly and will be safe. If you don't know that, baby will die. So those are the indications sometimes you hear women say, I oh, know they did a scissor because uh, uh, the, 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 there was meconium, okay? Uh, there was two in the, in the fluid, okay? <laughs> okay, We go to functions of amniotic fluid, slide 70. So, of course, mainly the main function is protection, okay, protection of the fetus, okay, because it's a, like a shock absorber, except, I mean, especially during uh, pregnancy, okay. But there are other functions we can see there during pregnancy, during labor, okay, that amniotic fluid has several functions, several functions. From protection, I want to highlight the fact that uh, amniotic fluid, you know, allows free movement of the fetus within within the sac. So the fetus is able to move, okay, or to swim uh, within the amniotic fluid, and that is important. Uh, it's like you you can't sit in one position for a very long time. Definitely, you start stretching your legs, okay, okay. That's exactly what happens also. If the, uh, with the fetus. It has to stretch, it has to do all those things. Okay? Now, if the amount of amniotic fluid is uh, little and is not allowing this free movement, it will be in that one position uh, for a long time and that will be dangerous. Because one, uh, the fact that it is in one position for a long time, it can develop what we call contractures. Okay? Contractures. Uh, the limbs, the lower limbs, if they were like this, uh, they will continue to be like this, and you can have what we call club foot. I'm sure we have a head of club foot, whereby a baby is born inside like that. And we have, we have uh, some people who walk like that uh, because, uh, you know, the, the club foot was not corrected. Uh, this club foot what we also call congenital talipase equinovirus. Okay. <laughs> That's medicine. Crab uh, food with lemon. Uh, in medicine, we call it congenital talipase equinovirus. Okay. CTEV, abbreviated CTEV. Congenital talipase equinovirus. Okay. That's a proper medical term. So that one it should be corrected, okay, uh, by orthopedic surgeons. So orthopedic surgeons uh, they will correct the uh, the club foot. 
But if you don't correct it, uh, the person will continue like that. And uh, we will start walking like that. So, uh, so cup foot can form, even uh, lung hypoplasia will form, and so on, contractures, including amniotic bands. If you look at uh, slide, slide 75, slide 75, there is a picture showing uh, amniot the effect of amniotic bands. So amniotic bands can form and amputate the limbs of the fetus. So you can imagine a baby being born like that, okay, where the limb has been amputated at the level of the leg, okay, in the middle of the leg, there is that amputation because of the amniotic band, okay. This is the effect of having uh, oligohydramnia, severe or remember describing the cord with the vessels there, okay, how many arteries, how many veins initially, cord. Okay, what surrounds these vessels, the connective tissue, the Watton's gel, huh? or gel of Watton, we remember that? Yes, so that was well covered. But just to emphasize the implantation, I mean the insertion site. If you go to slide 78, you see the contents of the umbilical ring. The primitive umbilical ring, you must know the contents of the primitive umbilical ring. Okay, the vessels, uh, the yolk sac, and its stock, including the Alan toys. The Alan toys is also a content. Okay, the Alan toys. Okay, you can see there a cross section showing the two umbilical arteries and one vein. Uh, this one vein is which one, left or right? This one vein is what? Left or right? It's the left, isn't it? So it's the left uh, umbilical vein. Initially there were two left and right, but the right one disappeared, uh, leaving the left. So this is the left umbilical vein, which becomes, after birth, the left umbilical vein becomes what? Those things, I remember, mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised that people are preparing for a test, but they don't. <laughs> yeah, so let's go to slide 81. Slide 81, attachment of the umbilical cord. So in the attachment, I just want you to appreciate the four types of attachments that can happen. Uh, most times, 90% cases, uh, it is eccentric. It's described eccentric, so eccentric insertion. Then you can have central insertion, you can have marginal insertion, 7%, and uh, you can have velamentous insertion uh, of the umbilical cord. Now, what do we mean by these terms? So, it depends with the uh, attachment sites. Okay, so if we go to Okay, the next slide is basically the amentus. But if we can, I'll do too much going back. But anyway, for you to appreciate, let's go back to the placenta. That uh, slide. Uh, so that you appreciate what eccentric means. We go back to slide 24. Slide 24. Are we there? Okay. So, on the feet of portion, where the cord it sets. If you look at this picture, and where the cord has inserted, if you look at the disc-shaped uh, placenta, the cord is not exactly in the middle of the surface. Have we seen that? Have we appreciated that? Yes, it's not exactly the center. Uh, it is between the, the center and the periphery, the margin. So it's between the center and the margin. So if a cord insects like that, that is what we call eccentric insertion. 
uh, type of insertion. So eccentric insertion is the most common type of insertion of the umbilical cord. If we say central insertion, it means that the cord has inserted exactly at the center of the cord. I mean, uh, placenta, sorry. It has inserted at exactly at the center of the placenta. That would be central. And if we say marginal insertion, it means the cord has inserted in the periphery of the placenta, in the margins. Okay, that would be marginal placenta. It, has, it is still on the placenta, but on the margins. Now, if we go to our velamentous insertion, uh, slide eighty-two, slide eighty-two. Are we there? Okay. So if you look at this one, it appears as if it's on the margin, but it's not. It's not on the margin. Uh, it has basically inserted on the membrane. You can see there is a, a gap there between the actual placental tissue. There is a black zone there. Are we able to appreciate that black zone and the cord? Yes, so showing you that it's not exactly on the placenta, though. The cord is away from the placenta. So it has inserted on the membrane, and then the vessels now are the ones which have gone to the placental tissue. So those things, uh, those are the vessels. You can see the vessels going to the placental tissue now. So the, in velamenta sensation, the cord inserts on the chorion, the membrane chorion, and then it spreads the vessels to the placental tissue. So that is velamentous insertion. <coughs> now, when there is a velamentous insertion, it's dangerous because the vessels beyond the insertion site, they are not protected by Watton's jelly because they're not surrounded by Watton's jelly. Watton's jelly is in the umbilical cord. That's why it appears whitish like this. Okay? But if the vessels uh, they have run from the cord to the placental tissue, like in this case, the vessels are not protected. And so they are at risk, at an increased risk of rupture. So they can rupture anytime. And when they rupture, this blood is what? Is it maternal or fetal? The blood that is going to come, come out is what? Fetal, isn't it? It's fetal blood. That's fetal blood because we are in the fetal circulation. So that's fetal blood. And remember that a fetus uh, does not have uh, a lot of blood like, uh, like an adult. An adult human being, on average, has total amount of uh, volume of blood around what? Five liters, isn't it? Five liters. But a fetus doesn't have five liters of blood. The fetus roughly maybe is having about less than 500 <coughs> mils. So, any slight loss of blood from the fetal circulation is very dangerous to the fetus. The fetus can die. So, if a woman has, uh, uh, you know, APH, what you call APH, and porridge, there is bleeding, it could be because these vessels are ruptured in, in, in a vasa previa, what we call vasa previa. Vasa previa, vasa for vessels, and then previa for low line. Okay? Now, uh, the previa, uh, it can mean low line or it can mean uh, uh, in front, in front of uh, the vessels. Okay? So it means, like in this case, in front of not the vessels, in front of the presentation of the fetus. So if the fetus is coming out like that, the vessels are in front of the head of the fetus. So this head can pass through the vessels and rupture the vessels. And then they'll be breathing. 
can very dangerous. And uh, uh, if it's was a pregnant, the baby dies within a short period of time. In a short period of time, uh, the baby dies. So this parameter sensation is associated with the advanced maternal age, about 35 years, okay? And diabetes mellitus, smoking, and of course, uh, single umbilical artery and fetal malformations. So that's typical cord abnormalities, you can have what we call false knots and true knots. A true knot, uh, it's just that I don't have a picture here, but a true knot is where uh, um, the cord, um, how can I describe it? A true knot is a, a true knot. <laughs> uh, okay, let me use this cable here. So with a true knot, if the cord, there's a true knot, it means that the umbilical cord, especially if it's longer than usual, so it will wind like that and then make such a knot. Okay? So this is a true knot. So an umbilical cord can have such uh, a knot. This is a true knot. As the baby is swimming and so on, if it's a longer one, it can go like that, do like that, and eventually form a true knot. Now this true knot is dangerous because if it's too tight, what will happen? Like. The vessels will be occluded, isn't it? Inside. And it means you have basically blocked the blood, the blood system uh, in the fetal placental situation. Okay, and that's dangerous. Uh, the fetus. Uh, is going to die. So that's a true knot. With a false knot, a false knot is, it appears as if it's a, 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 a you know, a knot, but really it's not a knot. Uh, it's just that on your stand, maybe you are seeing something like that. Okay, so it's like that. With a false knot, it's like that. But actually, there is no knot there. It's just that the cord has come together uh, next to each other like that. But it's not a knot, a true knot. Okay, so in, in this one, there is no risk of uh, a blockage of blood. So the blood will still circulate. But in a true knot, it's the other. Okay, that brings us to the end of the lecture. Thank you.